Well, good morning, Foothill Church. Today's scripture is found in Exodus 23, verses 20 through 33. Please stand for the word of the Lord. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring to you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out before you, In one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and then possessed the land. And I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out from before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. You shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. This is God's word. You may be seated. All right. Um, I want to jump in, but I want to say this before we get started too. Uh, I'm always amazed at God's providence. This has happened so many times in the life of the church that, that uh, somehow the Bible dovetails so perfectly with what's happening in our world. Um, I am not unaware of what's happening in Ukraine. In fact, I want you to see this morning how this this passage really helps us even think about it a little bit. Um, and and so, so hopefully you'll see that. And last week, the way that Lucas talked and showed us from that passage and how it intersects with what's going on in our culture right now, I think is so, so helpful. And I just praise the Lord that his word is like that. His word really does speak to uh, the issues of our day, but it's always amazing to me when it intersects with some kind of world event like what we're witnessing Uh, happening in Ukraine. Now, how many of you have taken a family vacation with little children? Lots of you, yeah. So this is a, it's a wonderful, terrifying thing, right? It's it's uh, it's something where like we, you plan, moms and dads, you get ready. You're like, man, I'm, I you you've maybe saved up money, all this stuff. We're going here. We're going to do this great uh, experience, wh- whatever it is. And then the day comes, you put them in the car. It takes about an hour uh, into it, and the kids are you know starting to poke each other and complain. And when are we going to get there? And you know I'm hungry, and I have to go to the bathroom. And all these things. You're thinking I could have saved a lot of money. And we could have complained at home, right? Uh, and didn't have to go through all of this. Some of you are like, hey, hey, listen, kids, we're going somewhere, and uh, I just want to make you aware. This is how this is going to work. Like, mom and dad are going to take every, take care of everything. We're, you know, we, we, we it's going to be fun. We're, we're going to go and, and enjoy good food and good experiences and all these things. And here's all I ask. You just need to be obedient to me. You need to listen to us we talk, go to bed and we tell you to go to bed, look out the window and we tell you to look out the window and stop looking at your iPad, all those kinds of things, right? And if you'll do what we say... It's going to be a great couple of weeks or week or whatever it is, right? If you don't, it's going to be a a, a week of misery, and and we don't want that for you. Now, the reason I bring that up is that's a little bit of what we're looking at today. What what, what we're coming to the end of is what's called the covenant code in Exodus, and this is where God has said, here's all my rules, right? And if you'll obey them, it's going to be great. I'm going to get you to the promised land and there's going to be, you're, you're going to enjoy some things. You're going, to, you're going to see the promises come to pass. But if you don't, like terrible things will happen. And I don't want those things to happen to you. So, so, so this is what's happening in this passage. So um, because I know we have limited time this morning with our kids here and all that, I want to just kind of give you the overview of what the principles are that we see in this passage. And I, I see four of them here that we need to see, and they're essentially answering some questions. Questions like, what will God do? 
um, how will he do it, um, what God requires, then who gets the credit, okay? So we're going to walk through each of those together, and I'm going to show you from Scripture where I get that, so it would be really, really helpful if you have your Bibles open. In fact, I'm going to uh, really ask you to have them because I, there's a place I want us to go together in just a moment here. But uh, the first thing I want you to see is we see in this passage what God will do, and it is simply God will fight for his people, now, before we look at Exodus here for a moment, let me remind you of something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and, uh, and verse uh, 11. Pa- Paul, writing about the Exodus, says the, this. He says, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So he's saying, look, I, it happened to them. That was an example. They need to learn these things. But it's also a warning for you and me. Now, how does that work? What's happening here? Well, it's important to remember that in the book of Exodus, what we've been looking at, as we said, is that this is really a picture, a story describing salvation. Yes, it's, it's happening to real people in real time, but there's some things, there's principles out of that that we're learning about what it looks like to be the people of God, to be saved from sin. So let's think about where Israel is right now in the Exodus story. They have been delivered fully from Egypt. We could say they're saved, but they're on their way to the promised land. They haven't arrived and received all the promises of God. They've been baptized in the Red Sea. The Bible's going to talk about that. They've been baptized into into this new community in the Red Sea, but they still have trials and temptations and tribulations and tests to go through, battles to fight, and they're going to have to fight. But they find themselves in this in-between time, already saved, but not yet the full fulfillment of all that God has for them. So this ought to sound very familiar. This is exactly where we find ourselves as believers in Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, then I can say you are saved, you are secure, but You're on your way to your full inheritance, and in this in-between time, you've been baptized, right? In this in-between time, there's trials, there's temptations, there's battles that we go through. Okay, so that's, that's what's happening here, and what I want you to see is that in the midst of those battles, the important thing for you to remember is you're not on your own. God fights for his people. So, so let me show you this. Go down to uh, verse ch- chapter 23, verse 22. He says, "I." this is the second part of verse 22, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Look at verse 23, when my angel goes before you and brings you the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, I blot, and I blot them out, okay? I'm, here's what I'm going to do uh, for you. Go down to verse 27. He says, I will send my terror before you, throw and throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I'll make all your enemies turn their backs to you, and I will send hornets before you, and shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites from before you. Okay, what's happening? God's saying, listen, I'm going to fight for you. You're my people. Your enemies will be my enemies, And when I show up, they're going to scatter. But this is what I'm going to do for you, right? I will conquer. I will blot out. I will drive out. I'll take care of them. You just walk in obedience to me. He uses that idea of, you know, a hornet. I'm going to send hornets. I don't think he means this literally. I think that's a, that's a picture to say what will happen. I mean, can you imagine if somebody released a couple nests of hornets in this room? You would all run in panic. Like, get out of the room as fast as possible. That's the idea. When God shows up, enemies scatter. This is exactly what's going to happen. If you were to turn over to Joshua chapter 2, you you run into this section that talks about, here's Rahab, the woman who lived in Jericho, saying, look, we heard about you guys, we heard about your God, and it made our hearts melt with fear. God is already going before his people. God fights for his people. In fact, I want you to do something. I don't have it in your notes there. Turn with me to uh, Psalm 35. Psalm 35. And I, I really do want you to look at this with me. If you've got an app on your phone, you've got your hard copy of a Bible, go to Psalm 35. So I want to show you something. Very often in the life of God's people, they would pray for God to fight for them. 
And they would pray in very specific ways. And this is what I want you to see. So when I say in God's providence, we come to this passage today, this is what I'm talking about. Like, like let, me, let me make this clear. In light of what's happening in Ukraine, there's a lot of ways that we can pray. And some of you have. And there's a lot of emotions going on in light of it. There's fear. There's anxiety. There's, there's, uh, there's worry. There's all kinds of, there's anger over what's happening. And the Bible takes account of all of those emotions. How do we pray in moments like this? What do we do when it seems that wickedness is just sort of invading? How do we respond to that? Well, there's all kinds of things we could say about that. I want to show you a biblical vocabulary. This is not the only way you can pray. I want you to see this is in Scripture. That's why it's so important that your Bibles are open. Here's David praying to God and talking about real enemies. Okay, we're not just talking about spiritual ideas. He's talking about real enemies, and I want you to hear how he prays. And let me, let me, let me sort of if you will, uh, restate this proverb as though David were Ukrainian. Listen to this. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with us. Fight against those who fight against us. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin the the stingray missiles, the javelin missiles against my pursuers. Say to the souls of my people, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek my life. Let the Russian army be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against us. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Remember that idea behind the angel of the Lord. For without cause, they hid their net for me. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. You ready? Let destruction come upon Vladimir Putin when he does not know it and let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting the salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Do you know this is actually a valid way of praying? That's in your Bible. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, may it be so. And God, we, we, we do pray. I, I want to pray that, Lord, you're a God who brings people to repentance. So, Lord, we do pray for repentance in the heart of Vladimir Putin. We pray you'd bring salvation to those who are giving him counsel, God, that they would come to a place of feeling repentant over their sin. But God, if not... If, if they steal their hearts against you, if they say we will not listen to the counsel of God, we, we have set our faces to do wickedness, then Lord, we pray with David, let destruction come upon him when he does not know it and let the net that he hid ensnare him, let him fall into it to his destruction, not to the destruction of the Ukrainian people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, most of us will never face battles like that. Does that mean we can't pray for the victory of God? No, of course not, because we know from Scripture that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle, here, let me say it, the battle of the Ukrainian people isn't against Putin and the Russian army. It's against principalities and powers, right? That we, we pray, yes, God, there, there are wicked people doing wicked things in this world, but behind them is a wickedness that is happening. So we wrestle against those things, and whether or not it's a real army or it's spiritual forces, everybody in this room wrestles against, has some kind of battle, especially if you're a believer in Jesus. You are going to face battles, the battle for your life, the battle for your Christian life. 
And so there's going to be things that you run into. Listen, this is what happens every time you kneel to pray and your mind wanders off. That's spiritual battle. Every time you pick up your Bible and you can't keep focus, that's a spiritual battle. Every time you say, man, I want to I wanna fight for holiness and stop committing this sin, that's a fight. Why do you feel that in your bones? Because there's a battle going on. It's a real battle. And in our modern world, we're going to think, oh, those things don't really happen. Of course they happen. They happen all the time. There's a fight for your faithfulness. Why does Christ-likeness feel like such a a fantastic idea that none of us can ever achieve, it feels like? Because there's a battle for your soul. So, 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 see, here's Israel going, we we have to be engaged in this battle. God's not going to say, hey, guys, I'll fight for you and you've got to do nothing you have to pray, you have to fight, you have to march. He says that to us. We have to pray, we have to fight, we have to march, we have to do the things that, 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 that amount to faithfulness in our world, but at the same time, we realize the battle doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. And God's the one who will fight for his people. It is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Be of good cheer, Christian. God fights for his people. And what a reassurance that is. The second thing I want you to see, the question we're answering is how will God do it? Turn to verses 29 and 30 and I want you to notice he'll do it little by little. Notice this, I will not drive them out from before you in one year lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possessed the land. You see what God is doing? He's like, I'm not going to give you the land all at once. I know you might want that. I know you might want complete and total victory from day one, but there's a very practical reason and there's a very spiritual reason I'm doing this. The practical reason is if I do this, then there will be all this land that becomes desolate and taken over by predators and wild beasts. So when you go, you got to start all over. I don't want that for you. I want you to come into vineyards you did not plant, in a land that you didn't, you didn't inherit. I'm going to come. I want to bring you to a place where you have all the fruits and the blessings, but it's going to happen little by little. Do you see the spiritual principle at play here? The Christian life is incremental. We would love it, wouldn't we? God, just Make me mature the moment you save me. And it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen that way, does it? It's God saying, I do this gradually. I do it incrementally. I do it because what am I doing? What's he doing? What's the spiritual thing he's doing to Israel that he's also doing to us? He's saying, listen, I don't want you to trust me for one giant battle. I want you to trust me day by day, moment by moment, in battle after battle after battle that I'm going before you. There, You can never, you can never lean back and go, I don't have to trust in God anymore. He's never going to do that for you. God wants us. Why? Because it's teaching us dependence. It's teaching us trust. It's teaching us perseverance. It's building our character. And God wants all those things. I mean, God could have saved us and sucked us into heaven. He didn't. He could have had the cross and resurrection. Day of Pentecost comes and he could have gone, we're done. What does he do? No, I'm going to save incrementally, little by little, more and more people until this vast host of people has been saved and I bring them into my kingdom. I mean, doesn't this help you with your own spiritual life? Doesn't it help you with other people's spiritual life, like your children? Like, man, I wish they would get this. It's because God patiently is working little by little by little to bring his people where he wants them to go. I'm gonna give you what I promised you. I'm not gonna give it to you all at once. It's this incremental growth. This is exactly what God is doing. He's, he's, he's causing them to grow. He's causing them to grow in their dependence. So, so be of good cheer. God fights for his people. How does he do it? He does it little by little, right? He allows us to, to, to have our characters refined slowly but surely. Like it will happen because God's behind it. Even when we feel frustrated, it's happening. The third thing is, what does God require? So, okay, I'm going to do all this for you. I'm going to bring you into the land. I'm going to fight for you. What does God require? We'll look down, go back to verse 21. 
He says, pay careful attention to him, that's the angel, and I'll talk about him in a moment, and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I'll be an enemy. Okay, look down at verse 24. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break the pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and he will take away sickness from among you. None shall miscarry. He gives all these promises. Go down to, to uh, verse 31. And I will set uh, your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness of the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out from before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. What's God saying through all of this? I'm gonna do all this for you. Here's what I need from you. No compromise. I need you to be obedient. And I'll talk about the angel. To me, to the angel. I need you to listen. I need you to give the enemy no quarter. We're not messing around here. You need to do everything in your power to separate yourself from sin. Do we get this? See, some people say Christianity isn't about rules, it's about relationship. You heard this before? That's just not true. Now, you understand, I, I think I know where that's coming from. It's saying we don't obey rules in order to gain our salvation. That's called legalism. But there are rules in every relationship. In fact, it's the relationship that leads to rules. Every relationship you have has rules. If you're married, there are things you do and do not do because you're married, because there's a rule that governs that. Why don't you commit adultery? Because I love my wife. I love my husband. Why don't we murder? That's for a relationship. Why don't we steal? That's for a relationship. Why don't we covet? That's for a relationship. Why do we honor? That's for a relationship. Why not idols? Why not another worshiping other gods? All of those come out of a relationship. So of course there's rules because there's rules to every relationship. So Jesus, God says, no compromise. Do not mingle your life with the pagans around you. Smash their altars, break down their idols. See, now look, by the way, uh, we read stuff like that in the Old Testament and that seems like, yeah, well, no duh. That almost seems like a no-brainer. And, and then we, 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 we read about Israel and we're like, are they, are they just daft? Are they stupid? Are, what, what is the problem with them? Because for us, smashing, you know, we don't worship idols. It seems so obvious. And, and, and what's crazy is this will become the, the, the pinch point. This will become the place where Israel fails time and again. What seems so obvious to us didn't seem so obvious to them. Why? Why is this the place they compromise again and again and again? Because, see, we, we think, we think idols, right? And so we think that seems easy. And if, listen, idols were all fanged demons, you know, with, with blood pouring out of them, we all go, yeah, no, no, I don't want that. But idols, you have to understand in this time, this is how everything worked, Everything revolved around idols. I mean, you wanted kids. Idols gave you kids. You wanted a fertile crop. They gave you a crop. They gave you financial wealth. They gave you success in the culture. Idols, were, they were just absolutely ordinary and normal. Now imagine Israel comes into a land, sees it flowing with milk and honey, seems like, boy, these people know what they're doing. They know how to cultivate. They know how to make these crops. They know how to really have a successful living. Maybe they know the secret sauce. So maybe if we do what they do, we'll be good. And God's saying, no, no, no. No, you don't compromise with them. You don't do what they do. Now, again, doesn't this sound familiar? It, 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 it's, it's, we look at our culture, we see people who are successful and have material gain or influential and famous or whatever, and we think, ah, they must know how to really work this world, so I'll do what they do. I'll climb the corporate ladder the way they do. I'll do business the way they do. I'll get academic success the way they do. 
I'll, I'll, I'll entertain myself the way they do. Why? Why do we go there? Because in the end, all those things seem so normal. They seem so ordinary, and they, they prov- they're, they're everywhere. But look at what God, look at his care and concern. Look at again at verse 32. Don't make a covenant with them or their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Now this is amazing. I want you to read it this way. God really cares about you. And he doesn't want you ensnared in things that will kill you. Listen to me, young people. There are times, there are, there are things that you will, you will start to dabble in. You may think it's no big deal that I'm doing this, no big deal that I looked at that. It's just a small little sin. And what, the, what, what, what God is saying here is, is ultimately those sins are like traps. They ensnare you and you can't get out. And you find yourself at my age and you look back and go, what did I do? I developed this pattern of disobedience that now has ensnared me. I can't get out of the way of doing business like this. I can't get out of, of looking at pornography. I can't get out of these sins of lying. I, there's all kinds of things because I started off, they were just these small things that I compromised with. And today they're eating me alive. This is God saying, man, I don't want that for you. I really care about you. Listen, church, let me say something. The greatest danger we face is not just in the 21st century, but forever, isn't a Russian invasion. The greatest danger we face is not loss of religious freedom. It's not the loss of our livelihoods. It's not persecution. The greatest danger Christians face is being tempted by a culture to be unfaithful to God. That is the temptation. Just give in. Just is like, the greatest temptation we face is when sin is made to look ordinary and normal and essential and righteousness is made to look strange and weird. Hear me. If righteousness is strange, if righteousness is weird, let's be weirdos. Let's be strange. Young people, when you go to school, those of us who are in careers, those of us who are interacting with neighbors, one of the things we're told over and over again is that we are strangers in this world. We are aliens in this world. This world is not our home. And we are called, in some ways, Jesus. You know, I think it's Austin and Portland have this Keep Portland Weird. We did a sermon series a few years ago on the Sermon on the Mount because the whole, th- the whole idea behind the Sermon on the Mount is keep Christianity weird. Be weird if that's what it takes. If that means, if that's how we don't compromise with the culture, if that's how we, how we don't give up on being a faithful presence for God in our culture, then we better be strange because there's a, there's a temptation for us to punt on faithfulness. Now, let me show you one last thing. That's who gets the credit. Notice it's this angel, okay? I read about him in Psalm 35 and now look back at verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way to bring you to the place that I have prepared. I, any of you who have read your Bibles or been in Christianity long enough should start to feel some echoes there. I'll show you in a moment. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him. Who is this angel? Look at verse 22, but if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, and you're going to see this back and forth, the whole, the whole rest of this chapter, he says, I say, he says, I say. So God is equating, he says, my name is in him. This is not just a prophet. This is, this is not just a man. Very likely, this is This is God incarnate, we might say. This is God come in the form of an angel, what people understand to be the angel of the Lord. Some scholars think the angel of the Lord is is Jesus before he came as a a human being. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, I don't know, 
You know, the debate is on. There's been a lot of ink spilled over who is this angel. But listen, I think that what we can say is that if nothing else, this angel points to Christ, looks forward to Christ, says things that only are fulfilled in Christ. Jesus says himself, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I'm going to bring you to where I am so that where I am, you may be also. That's what the angel's doing. I'm going to go before you to this place that I prepared you. I'm going to guard you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. And, and I will, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus says. I don't know if you noticed this. Go, go back to, to verse 21. It says about the angel, don't rebel against him for he will not pardon your transgression for my name is in him. Okay, well, if this is Christ, doesn't Christ pardon our sin? Here's what I think is happening there. I think he's saying, just like God, you understand that God can't just forgive sin? Did you know this? He can't just say, oh, you sin, whatever. I'll wipe it away. In fact, the Bible says specifically, the judge who lets the guilty go free is an abomination. God will not be an abomination. So what does he do? He's saying this, this angel, this Christ figure, cannot just make executive fiat and pardon your sin. Oh, so what does he do? I turn the pages. That's why Paul calls it the mystery that now it gets fulfilled when we go to the New Testament. And I see, oh, well, he didn't just say, hey, everybody, I know you've done a bunch of stuff wrong. You're forgiven. No, what he does is he goes and gets nailed to a cross and takes our sins on himself. So that all of our sins are pardoned, not because he says they don't matter, but because all of them were paid for in Jesus Christ. This is what's happening. Here's the angel, and he gets the credit. And the Lord says, all you need to do is listen to him. And listen to me. Here's what he's saying. If you'll listen, and by listen he means if you'll obey, and pay careful attention and do what he says, then here's the promise. He will bring you safely home. He will get you where I've promised he'll get you. They're gonna fail. They're gonna fail. They're gonna fail to, to, to uh, do all that God commanded, which is why we need the New Testament, which is why we need Jesus to come, which is why we need the cross and the resurrection to be able to pay for the sins that we've committed. But he says, you pay attention to him and he'll get you home. He's the one who is faithful. He's the one who deserves all the credit. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, I just pray uh, that, Lord, we would be people who would walk in faithfulness, listening carefully to what you've commanded. We have people who wouldn't compromise we have people who know that, God, the battle does not belong to us. You're not asking us to, to take up arms against those that we consider our enemies. But Father, you, you will do battle for your people, and I thank you for that. Lord, some of us find ourselves in the midst of what we understand to be progressively becoming more like Jesus and it's hard and, and we find ourselves, it just feels like there's such slow progress, but God, I thank you there's progress. And I thank you, Lord, that you, you have gone before us and you will help us and you will be the one that brings us faithfully home. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in here, Lord, those who are struggling in their faith those who are seeing slowness in their sanctification. God, you are not slow to help and you will go before us and you will help us and you will be faithful to complete everything you've started in us. And I pray, Lord, for those who are here today who are far from you, that are apart from you. They've never put their faith, their trust, their hope in Jesus Christ. They're hoping in themselves. They're hoping in their own abilities to make them right with you. But God, here is this...
this passage, here's the Bible over and over again that says, man, you can't do it on your own, but God will do it for you. And so, Lord, I pray today would be a day that people would turn and put their trust in Jesus, put their faith in, in Jesus and turn away from their sin. God, may it be so and may it happen. I can't cause that to happen, God. That's only something that your spirit can do in this room. And so I pray that you would. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. And thank you, Jesus. We worship you because you are the one who will bring us safely home. And we ask this in your name. Everybody said, amen, amen.